Russia steps up missile attacks on Kyiv, and Ukrainian troops make territorial gains in the east. Vladimir Zelensky secures more weapons from Western allies, but will it make a difference on the battlefield? And does diplomacy stand a chance? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the program. I'm Nastasia Tay. Fifteen months into Russia's invasion of Ukraine, President Volodymyr Zelensky has secured further military support from Western allies. They promised more weapons, training and money, but stopped short of providing the F-16 fighter jets that he says could be a game changer. As Russia escalates its missile attacks ahead of an expected Ukrainian counteroffensive, six African leaders are now planning a peace mission to Moscow and Kyiv. So what are the interests at stake? And how could they shift political alliances? We'll explore those issues with our guests shortly, but first, this report by Katia lopez Horoyan. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky had a long wish list for his three-day European tour. Much of it was granted, with leaders promising billions of dollars worth of missiles, tanks and drones. We're returning home with new military help, newer and more powerful weapons for the front lines, and more protection for our people. We also have greater political support. However, his request for F-16 fighter jets has been rejected, with pilot training programs offered instead. Which will mean that we're training Ukrainian uh, citizens to become absolutely combat-ready aircraft pilots, uh, and particularly whether it comes to NATO tactics as well, because that's an important part of the long-term relationship between our countries. Many Western allies, notably U.S. President Joe Biden, are hesitant to supply Kyiv with American-made weapons that can reach Russian soil. But Zelensky insists the weapons are vital to defend Ukraine against escalated airstrikes. The latest offer to mediate comes from African nations. A delegation of six countries, including Egypt and South Africa, is set to meet the Russian and Ukrainian leaders soon. President Putin and President Zelensky agreed that they would be willing to receive the mission of the African heads of states in both Moscow and Kyiv. Most African nations have abstained from voting on UN resolutions condemning the invasion. Russia has been building close ties with states in Africa since the conflict began, and Ukraine is one of the biggest exporters of wheat to the continent. Fifteen months into the war, the list of countries attempting to broker peace between Russia and Ukraine is spreading across regions. Katia lopez Odoyan for Inside Story. Well, let's bring in our guests. In Kyiv, we have Peter Zalmayev. He is the executive director of the Eurasia Democracy Initiative, a non-profit organization that promotes democracy in post-communist transitional societies. In London, Samuel Romani. He's an associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute, a leading UK defense and security think tank. Samuel is also the author of Putin's War on Ukraine. And in the Russian capital, Moscow, we have Vladimir Sotnikov. He's an associate professor of international relations at the Higher School of Economics University and also a specialist on Russian foreign affairs. A warm welcome to you all and thanks so much for joining us on Inside Story. Now, President Vladimir Zelensky has just come back from his grand European tour asking for more weapons, so I, I want to start there. As Katia just reported, he's gotten a lot of what's on his wish list, but not these F-16 fighter jets, at least not yet. Pisa, was it a success? Yeah, I think overall it was a great success. And I think, you know, the, the fact that uh, our president has collected these uh, essentially pledges by member states of NATO, including France, a crucial player, uh, that supports uh, Ukraine's eventual membership in NATO was very important, you know. And I would probably discount at this point the importance of F-16 uh, short term, because obviously it will take not uh, not weeks but months to get our pilots trained. Mm. Uh, so this may be a little bit of a, you know, um, a red herring, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, what, what is important is to get in as much of an uh, artillery support, uh, tanks, um, you know, electronic uh, 
um, devices, etc., that Ukraine needs in order to stage a successful counteroffensive. F-16 is very important, and you know what? I believe they will be coming eventually uh, for whatever post, uh, you know, war. Uh, a security arrangement is found for Ukraine. And long term, I think Ukraine needs them. But short term, I think Ukraine, it will be tough. It won't be overnight. But I think Ukraine's counteroffensive can be successful without F-16s. Well, we've seen quite a, a robust round of weapons commitments. It's obviously a very fine line for Western countries. They want to support Kyiv, but they also don't want to do something that would escalate the war. Uh, Vladimir, how is this latest round of commitments being viewed in Moscow? Uh... Thank you very much for having me on your show once again. I think that uh, actually uh, all the offers, so all the pledges, which uh, my Ukrainian colleague was mentioning uh, in his uh, um, in his view, actually they are not very much welcome. They, they, uh, in fact, they, they, they are not welcomed in Moscow. I think that uh, uh, Russia actually will uh, utilize all possible efforts. Uh, uh, including uh, strikes, which we have seen just now, I mean, in, in the previous night and uh, before that. Uh, and also, I think uh, the um, situation will be then there will, the strikes will be reoriented on the transfer uh, routes of uh, these uh, tanks. Uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure at all that uh, uh, the United States or some European allies of the United States are going to really supply Ukraine with F-16 um, uh, fighter bombers, because that means that uh, uh, the serious weapon is already engaged in the war and the war will be escalating. So I, I, I don't, uh, I'm not sure that uh, the U European allies and the United States would like to escalate uh, for, for the escalation of the war. So I think that uh, um, at the end of the day, uh, Russia will uh, undertake all the necessary measures uh, to uh, cope with the problems of the uh, Western-backed uh, uh, supplies of sophisticated weaponry to Ukraine. Sure, but it doesn't sound like Moscow necessarily views this as an escalation. Uh, Samuel, you're sitting in London. The UK has said that they're going to be supplying long-range missiles to Ukraine, which would cover more distance than what Ukraine currently has. How much of a difference do you think these weapons will actually make to fighting on the ground and strategy? So I think that Britain has already supplied these Storm Shadow missiles, and the Russians have said that the Storm Shadow missiles were already put onto the battlefield with the strike that we saw last week in Luhansk. So uh, these are also going to be paired with additional drone technologies. Obviously, the Ukrainians have been wanting long-range missiles for a long time. They've wanted attacks from the United States, but there have been some concerns, obviously, in Western capitals that Ukraine might use them outside of just the occupied Ukrainian regions, but actually to strike Russian territory proper. So Ukraine made an assurance to Britain that it wouldn't do that, and then it got these long-range missiles. So I think that it's a significant advantage for the Ukrainian cause, and also it's interesting that they've been very swiftly integrated onto the battlefield, unlike uh, the F-16s, as we just mentioned, which could take months to enter the battlefield. Uh, Samuel, I just want to follow up there. The line that Kyiv is sticking to, that it's acting defensively, that it's not attacking Russian territory, in your assessment of the war so far, how true is that? Well, I mean, it depends on what you define as actual defensive actions. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, Vladimir Zelensky and his team around it have categorically denied that they're striking targets inside Russia. But we've seen some uh, anecdotes and some suggestions to the contrary. I think there were some interesting uh, leaks, for example, that came through from The Washington Post that suggested that uh, Zelensky was at least mulling uh, occupying Russian villages and, and uh, striking the Druzhma pipeline towards Hungary. And uh, also there was a plan from his advisory circle to strike Syria, as Zelensky put, a, put the brakes on. And there's also recurrent to shellings and attacks that we're seeing inside Belgorod and Bryansk and Kursk, near the borders of Russia, and even further on, which could have been uh, triggered by uh, Ukrainian attacks and infiltration behind enemy lines. Obviously, though, if they're targeting logistics and the military of Russia from inside, that could be deemed as a defensive operation in a oh. sense because that's preventing the Russians from striking Ukrainian cities. But the Russians would probably take that as an escalation. So it really depends on how you define defensive and offensive action. Ukraine denies striking Russia, but there's some contextual evidence that they have been engaged in those type of activities. Sure. Peter, I see you nodding there. That's your assessment, too? 
Uh, I would just say that in, in response to the previous uh, panelists and the Russian uh, participant, uh, that you know, for Russia, Russia considers and can consider anything as escalatory, considering that the occupied territory where Ukraine is hoping to stage its counteroffensive, including Kherson and Zaporizhia, Donetsk, and Crimea, they are already, according to the Russian Constitution, part of the. Russian territory, and there's no difference between Moscow and uh, Crimea in the eyes of a uh, Russian lawmaker or a Russian politician or a Russian military person. So, uh, you know, uh, it's very much a moot point at this point after we've seen time and again the way Russia has reacted to these escalatory tactics. You know, they have thrown everything they have at Ukraine. I wish our co panelists from Russia experienced at least one night the sort of night we experienced. Three days ago, when woken up at three in the morning and all hell breaks loose over you, literally what it felt like your rooftop, you know. So I, I, at this point, I don't understand what that escalation that uh, Russia is warning about could mean short of a nuclear war. So I wouldn't put too much stock in it. And, uh, you know, uh, Lisa, sorry, I do also, want to ask also, you about something that you said a moment yes. ago, which was well, your suggestion that. Kyiv doesn't need these F-16s to win the war. You talked about them being used in a post-war context, right? I'm curious about why Kyiv wants these F-16s. I mean, I understand that there are air facilities in Ukraine, very, very few of them that could actually handle the jets, obviously, as you suggested as well, a huge amount of training. Is this about symbolism or is it actually about strategy? Well, you know, I think it's, uh, well, once again, it's tied in with the longer uh, term strategy uh, of security for Ukraine. Ukraine is very mindful that we're dealing with, when it comes to our allies in the West, members of the Rammstein coalition, NATO states, uh, these are electoral democracies, and uh, winds uh, of democracy blow, uh, are very capricious. One day, today, they're blowing one direction, tomorrow they'll be bl blowing a different direction, to put it uh, bluntly, Ukrainians are, uh, you know, concerned about, um, you know, the these wins in Washington, whether they will shift come uh, the elections in 2024. If election, if the Republicans or Donald Trump take power again, then you know all bets are off. And so this is a way to get in as much weaponry and as many security guarantees as possible before those inevitable. Uh, winds of change, you know, set in in the uh, U.S. and other Western capitals. So anxiety then potentially in Kyiv, given the context of the 2024 election. Vladimir, I'm curious about how that's going over and how that's sitting at the moment in Moscow. Yeah, excuse me, excuse me. I, I just want to make a point to the previous reply of Ukrainian guest. Actually, uh, I would also would like to, for you to know that uh, uh, he, you, you will get the experience of having sustained a continuous bombardment of the Ukrainian drones uh, on the Belgorod area, actually. My, 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 my close relatives live there, and they have small children, so uh, sorry to say that. But actually, they have to abandon their houses because of Ukrainian drones were bombarding by the rockets of uh, the uh, near, near side area. So that's actually also an experience probably for you will be, yes? And another thing I would like to point out uh, that uh, 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 Moscow actually uh, is not fearing the Ukrainian account, so-called counteroffensive at all. I mean, uh, we are concentrating our troops, and I heard in the news that uh, the uh, total amount of the troops will be uh, or maybe around 500,000. So uh, one thing. Another point is that uh, uh, the um, uh, Russia, Russia actually is uh, ma making tactics, as far as I can uh, understand, in the um, uh, waging the uh, um, combat uh, combat operations. Actually, Russia is uh, giving the floor to professionals, to professionals like uh, uh, private company, private military company, Wagner. And the Wagner company actually is doing their job right. So I think that uh, at the end of the day, uh, my point, and I'm absolutely sure of that, that uh, if uh, and when this uh, uh, so-called Ukrainian uh, counteroffensive would take place, and I anticipate it would take place probably in a week or in a month in between these uh, periods, so I don't. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure at all that Ukraine will get much 
uh, the advantages and much superiority and much gains. Thank you. Gentlemen, I feel like this is a good time to take a bit of a look at who controls what on the ground at the moment. Ukraine says it continues to make gains in the east, specifically around the eastern city of Bakhmut. Fighters belonging to Russia's Wagner Group hold most of that city, the site of one of the longest and bloodiest battles of this war. And Russia, meanwhile, says it's carried out several ground attacks along the Donetsk front. Now, Vladimir, you were just saying there that Wagner's been doing an excellent job. There were recent reports, or well, rumours that, well, disputed reports, that Wagner had been actually sharing intelligence with Kyiv. I know Kyiv denies this, but regardless of all of that, there's... There's, you can't deny that there's been a huge amount of disunity on the Russian front. Well, actually, I think this is rubbish. I think I don't know where you get this information, but I think this information that Wagner Group is sharing some intelligence information with the Ukrainian military, I think that's a completely wrong, a wrong, a wrong assumption. I, uh, you know, Mr. Prigozhin, who is the chief of the Wagner Group, he's not going to be. Uh, Say uh, a predator, or well, let's say to be to be a traitor for uh, for his own country. Uh, that's one thing. Another thing, I think. Uh, sorry, what was the second part of your question? I um, I, I just lost it. Well, no. So I, I understand that these are disputed reports, sir. But there have been huge amounts of disputes between Wagner and the Russian military, very public ones over the last few weeks and months, particularly around Bakhmut. You can't say that there's a huge amount of unity in, in the fighting forces there. Uh, well, yes, yes, I agree with you. There were some reports, and I read it in uh, here and in Russia, in Moscow, uh, that uh, there were uh, reports that uh, there is uh, uh, some uh, ongoing battles uh, uh, in uh, in Artyomovsk or Bakhmut, as you call it. So, but uh, I think that uh, there was information, and I'm just reiterating myself again, that the huge uh, huge amounts of the uh, troops of the Russian troops. Uh, will be or uh, are going to be amassed uh, along the all the front line, which is uh, quite uh, uh, quite a fixed line actually right now. And uh, uh, moreover, I think that the the war actually the uh, Ukrainian Russian war is at the moment of uh, position war. Then uh, no side is going just to um, uh, undertake something without the uh, much of preparation. OK, well, let's talk about this counteroffensive that we expect to happen. Uh, Samuel, from previous Ukrainian strategies, do you envision this to be more about trying to retake territory, potentially, or, or taking out, like, different strategic targets instead? How intense could this fighting get? Well, I think that this counteroffensive is going to be uh, important in terms of the taking of territory. And what we're already seeing is uh, some limited uh, movements in a variety of potential axes, as well as what the United States calls shaping operations which are preventing and derailing Russia's ability to retaliate for Ukrainian advances. So we're basically seeing some shaping operations take shape in uh, parts of Zaporizhia, such as Tokmak, which could lead to a broader assault on the uh, city of Melitopol. And if the Ukrainians do manage to liberate Melitopol, they will be able to disrupt the uh, Russian supply chains uh, further from Crimea towards Donbass. Another area where the Ukrainians are trying to expand is in Luhansk, particularly along the axis between Svatovo and Crimea. There's heavy Russian fortifications there, but Ukraine has been making slow but steady gains over there over the course of the past uh, several weeks. And then there's what we've been just noticing in Bakhmut, where the Ukrainians have managed to take advantage of the fact that the water group forces are concentrated on urban battles in the city center, and they've been able to liberate 20 square kilometers on the northern and southern flanks. So I think that there'll be a multiple axis counteroffensive where they liberate territory and they combine that with attacks on Russian logistics, both in the occupied territories and perhaps deniably inside Russia itself. So it sounds like preparations are, are very much in place. I'm curious about how this is being viewed in Kyiv, because as we've been talking about, there have been these escalating missile strikes on the capital over the course of, of recent days. Peter, you were just describing them yourself. Is that viewed there as a reflection of Moscow being worried about the counteroffensive, or is it about preempting it? Yes, indeed. Uh, it is, by all indications, a very uh, troublous, troublesome time for, uh, for, for Moscow. Mind you, uh, that a drone attack on the Kremlin was the first time that this impregnable, uh, up until then, impregnable fortress uh, in the heart of the 
country in the heart of its capital was breached. You know, the first time was in 1986 when uh, a German pilot, Matthias Roost, uh, landed on the Red Square. So a scandal of major proportions. And throughout Russia, we've seen, starting uh, you know, last summer, uh, a spate of uh, arsons, uh, uh, fire attacks, uh, attacks on various um, uh, oil depositories, military uh, military uh, objects, and uh, just a few days ago, of uh, three uh, helicopters and two planes shot down over the Bronsk area uh, as they were en route to attack uh, Ukrainian, essentially civilians, all down in one day. And just yesterday, a milestone was reached. 200,000 Russian soldiers, as reported by the Ukraine's defense ministry, uh, have died in this war, which is 10 times the number of Soviet soldiers who died in the war in Afghanistan in 10 years. So, yes, uh, Russians are, uh, and the Kremlin is very, very uh, concerned about the coming counteroffensive. And uh, obviously, these are uh, a lot of them are retaliatory um, attacks, mm -hmm. uh, these shellings on Kiev, which you would doubt about their efficacy and about their, you know, what the, the purpose is, because Ukrainians have shown that, you know, a tremendous success rate shooting down these missiles, including. Uh, the missile that's, that Vladimir Putin has claimed cannot be sh shot down, mm -hmm. and which is Kinjal. And the patriots uh, that have been delivered to Ukraine are now uh, being shown to successfully disable even these hypersonic missiles. OK, I want to take a bit of a step back here at this point, because it's been a year and a quarter, 15 months, since this war began. I know Moscow has been releasing policy documents um, about countering the West broadly. And they hardly mention Ukraine, but surely this is viewed as part of that. Is this war being viewed as, as part of broader Russian foreign policy and therefore Moscow is in it for the long haul? Well, actually, uh, yes, there was a concept, uh, a concept, uh, a new concept of Russian foreign policy, Luke. And uh, the problem uh, for us, actually, that uh, really, uh, that is a uh, uh, proxy war by the Western countries, as this policy document is saying. So, uh, and uh, uh, I think that uh, the relations between Russia and uh, the Western countries, I, I, I'm not uh, telling only about the uh, United States or, uh, say, uh, European, Euro United States, European allies, like Germany, France, and others. I think these relations uh, have been spoiled for, for, for years to come. So I think that uh, Ukrainian uh, conflict actually uh, was one of the pretexts uh, pretexts of, 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 of for publishing this document. But another thing also I would like to add that uh, since 2014 it became clear that uh, Russia is not going to be accepted by the Western countries in terms which uh, how they it conducts uh, its uh, foreign policy. So I. I think that is no wonder that uh, this uh, new policy document actually appeared. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, uh, it's going to be uh, uh, probably another documents like uh, another concepts uh, uh, soon when, when uh, the, there will be a continuation of this war. Sure, it does feel, though, like the Kremlin is wait it's playing a bit of a, a waiting game to see how long Western unity will last, and it, it has held so far. Uh, Samuel, I want to ask you just a little more about the F-16s, because I recall Ukraine got their tanks from the West in March. Like, six months before that, sending tanks would have been seen as a huge escalation. Do you think that that might be the same case um, when it comes to the F-16s, that it's really just a matter of time, and that Western unity will hold long enough for that to happen? Yeah, I think that uh, building on the past point, it does seem as if the Russians are counting on Western disunity still, even though the West has remained remarkably united during this war. We just saw Sergei Lavrov yesterday, for example, just uh, remind uh, international audiences about the fact that the U.S. abandoned the Afghan government and let the Taliban take over in 2021, and implying that something similar could happen with regards to U.S. support for Ukraine. Turning towards the uh, specifics of the F-16s, I think it's more and more likely that the United States will eventually uh, cave on supplying these as well as other Atacams uh, towards the Ukrainian army. Long-range missiles are being restricted because of supply constraints, according to Mark Milley, not because of escalation risks. Mm -hmm. And the F-16s are probably due to the fact that they're just not going to arrive in time for the current counteroffensive. So I think that the more the countries are training Ukrainian pilots to use them, like the British training efforts, the Belgian training efforts, and many others that we've noticed over the course of the past uh, 
a uh, couple of weeks, including during Zelensky's tour, and it seems as if Ukraine is prepared to use them, then I think that the F-16s will eventually enter the battlefield. And one last point, it's important to keep in mind that this Ukrainian counteroffensive, regardless of whether it succeeds or how much it succeeds or fails, is not going to be probably the last one in this war. Mm. The Russians are in this hall, as are the Ukrainians, and the F-16s could come uh, into uh, effect during another counteroffensive that the Ukrainians launch in the future. Sure. Well, if everyone's in it for the long haul, let me ask then about the ongoing mediation efforts. China's now got a mediation effort going. African leaders are on their way to Moscow and Kyiv. The Pope Francis wants to get involved as well. Uh, Peter, how is this viewed in Kyiv? Is any of this going anywhere? Well, uh, Kyiv obviously cannot antagonize China, considering what a crucial player it is in world affairs, and it's making efforts to, uh, you know, good faith efforts to engage with uh, China, whose special representative was just in Kyiv. Um, you know, having said that, uh, Ukraine is wary that uh, China is also guided by the uh, its imperative to uh, not allow Putin to uh, lose uh, face or uh, to lose. Uh, the war too dramatically because of Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping's governments are alike in that they uh, have challenged the liberal world order led by the United States and the allies. And so these uh, you know, various um, peacekeeping uh, uh, initiatives uh, and, uh, sure. you know, that we see coming not just from China, but from Brazil and from most recently from South Africa, these are all members of the so-called BRICS, uh, which yeah. is a grouping of countries where Russia is also a part of. And so Ukraine has officially to welcome it. But once again, sure. I think we are very, very concerned about the impartiality of L these me... players and the way they're trying to keep Vladimir Putin's face intact. You mentioned impartiality there. Let me ask very, very briefly, Vladimir, to come in on that. How is the African Peace Initiative at the moment being viewed in Moscow? Well, actually, thank you very much for your question. It's uh, really an important question. I think that uh, uh, it, it has been welcomed, actually. The Russian Foreign Ministry just today published a statement in which uh, uh, it says that uh, uh, Moscow is uh, welcoming this initiative. And I think uh, that uh, Mm, uh, there will be really a talks uh, when, during the visit of this uh, African mission uh, to Moscow. There will be talks not only between the head of the delegation, but also uh, and the uh, Russian foreign minister, but also I think the President Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin will accept them. Uh, another thing, I just want to make one point very shortly. I will just one make point. If any plan uh, will not be uh, including any uh, anything which is not suitable for Russia, I think the peaceful negotiations won't be a success at all. So they will fail. I, I hope I hope that this African military mission. I'm not sure, familiar with the details of the plan, but I hope that this uh, uh, African delegation, African mission, have a realistic plan of uh, peaceful mm -hmm. settlement of this. Well, we'll leave the discussion there for now. There's plenty more to talk about. But thank you to all of our guests, Peter Zalmayev, Samuel Romani, and Vladimir Sotnikov. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website. That's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Remember, you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nastasia Tay, and the whole team here, bye for now.